everyone, I'm Priyanka. Um, I'm a second year resident. Um, and I want to talk to you guys about the history of racism in medicine. Uh, I just want to thank the social EM team, Dr. Gopal and Dr. Chai, for giving me some feedback um, and the their presentation. I'm a descendant of slavery. Um, my mother's from Haiti, and she was born and raised here, and I stand before you as a second year president, and what I believe in work is one of the best works in medicine for the rest of the country. It's perfect for me to give this lecture to you guys. Um, I think it's very important. It's a well-needed discussion, um, especially right now with what's been going on politically. Um, but unfortunately, 30 minutes is not enough time to discuss hundreds of years of mistreatment um, towards the Black community. Um, but what I've researched, I just want to talk about three major things with you guys. One is just historical factors leading to distrust in the healthcare system. Two, to recognize racial healthcare disparities throughout medicine. And three, what I think is most important, tools to help improve our relationship with their patients. What we can do better for our patients to try to have them trust us better. Um, so if you guys work with me clinically, you would know that I love obstetrics and gynecology. <laughs> I love my OBGYN patients. Um, so it's fitting for me to talk about Dr. Sims. Um, he's known as the father of modern day gynecology. Um, he developed the speculum. He also um, developed a technique for the repair of the physical vaginal fistula. He um, practiced in Alabama in the 1950s and later on moved to New York. Poor Anarcha, Lucy, and Betsy. These are three of the 11 slaves that we know that he performed procedures on. He um, performed procedures on them um, mainly to repair um, physical vaginal fistulas, um, and they're between the ages of 17 and 18. Just to give you guys some background, in 1808, there was a federal ban placed to prevent the importation of slaves from other country. As a result, there was more of an incentive um, for slave births. Um, a normal, a common complication people had um, was VDF, and J. Marion Sims used this to her advantage to practice on slaves in order to uh, perfect this technique. A lot of slaves, when they dealt with VDF, they were, weren't able to work in the fields, they weren't able to reproduce, um, and it basically limited uh, slave owners from having productive slaves. And a lot of other physicians used this to advantage to work on slaves. And slave owners found this as a way to find a cheap labor and a cheap way to help um, have slaves um, be healthy and get evaluated by doctors. Another thing I want to talk about is he would perform a lot of his procedures on slaves without any anesthesia. At the time, chloroform and ether were um, forms of anesthesia that was used on patients. Um, I just want to go back to the previous picture, and this is actually an illustration of how we did the procedure. So he'd have a bunch of physicians in the room, and he'd have uh, two to three slaves holding the, the patient down. Um, the patient would be on all fours, um, and uh, they would be screaming in pain, and they would need a lot of fluids to hold them down to, so they wouldn't move. Over time, um, he became less supported in the field because a lot of white physicians were uncomfortable to see slaves screaming in pain. Um, although he said um, there was this widespread belief at the time that black people had a less uh, pain tolerance or higher pain tolerance, I'm sorry, so they didn't need anesthesia. But he wrote an autobiography, and in his autobiography, he wrote about Lucy in particular. Her agony was so extreme that he thought she was going to die. Um, he wrote this down, but he still thought that at the time, slaves did not need anesthesia. I also want to talk about Anarka. She was 17. He performed 30 procedures on her. Um, it was never successful. Um, her BDF would always open again. This is a picture of his uh, Montgomery, Alabama office that later closed down, but like I said, he lost a lot of support in the field and he had to um, basically create a shack in his backyard to perform procedures on these slaves. Um, I just want to show this picture to you guys um, just to give you an idea. So I'm going to show you a picture on the next slide on his uh, New York City art office. Another thing I want to talk about is a lot of these slaves um, either died or um, had really bad septic shock and became like basically, um, they, built, they couldn't work anymore. And he blamed, uh, these poor outcomes, um, and I quote, the sloth and ignorance of their mothers and black midwives who tend to them. He never thought these failures were due to him. He thought it was purely due to the slaves, and these slaves that took care of them post-procedure. Fast forward to a year later, he created the Women's Hospital. It was on a corner of 29th Street in Madison Avenue. It's a four-story, 20-bed institution. Um, he performed procedures on rich, wealthy white men in, in New York and across the world. Um, at this time, he did use anesthesia on his patients. So within a year, he thought a year ago, slaves did not need anesthesia. The pain wasn't that bad, it was unbearable, but he did give anesthesia on rich white females. Jim Arnson's is just one example. Um, there's hundreds and hundreds of experiments I could talk about, but like I said, it's not enough time. So I'm gonna talk about three other um, physicians um, in this lecture. 
One is Dr. Lynn Mack, and this is an uh, illustration of uh, Lucinda. She had a bony tumor in her right eye. He poured four holes in her head, um, basically to help relieve the symptoms, leaving her disfigured to not use any anesthesia on her. Another slave, her name was Harriet. She suffered from epilepsy. Doctors shocked her, electrocuted her for 53 minutes straight. She was electrocuted. She did not get any form of sedation, any form of pain management. Doctors had to hold her down and they interpreted her protest uh, and they quote a sign of electrotherapy efficacy. Many of you guys know about the Tuskegee experiments. It was done in 1932 uh, to 1972. The US Public Health Service conducted a study uh, to essentially see the effects of syphilis, um, untreated syphilis on patients. They enrolled over 400 black men and these men were under the impression that um, they would be treated for the physical ailments and we got exchanged for food and medical care. Um, this ended in 1972. This was 48 years ago. Um, a lot of these patients, either a lot of have family members that know these patients are alive to this day. One can make this connection to present day with COVID. I've had a lot of patients refusing to get swabs from COVID because they think one, they're only given the virus, or two, there's no um, true study. We don't really know what these tests mean. Initially, I used to get frustrated, like, why are you protesting this? Of course, we wouldn't want to harm you. This is our job to help you guys and protect you guys and serve you guys. But after doing this lecture, I realized that this is why there's so much trust. And this is something that's as recent as 48 years ago. It's not something that happened over 20 years ago. Henrietta Lacks, I'm sure many of you guys are aware of who she is. Um, if not, she is uh, she was born and raised in Baltimore. She died at the age of 31 from cervical cancer. Um, she was a son of slaves as well. She was poor. And Johns Hopkins at the time was the only hospital that would treat poor black people. In exchange, um, physicians thought that they could do experiments on them as a form of compensation because black people weren't able to pay for medical treatment. Um, during one of her procedures, uh, physicians took her cell and reproduced the cell in the Hula. So this is a picture of her consent um, from the procedure she had in Hopkins um, when they actually extracted her cells. I'm gonna read the consent to you guys. It states, I hereby give consent to the staff of the Johns Hopkins Hospital to perform any operative procedures under any anesthetic, either local or general, that they may be necessary in the proper surgical care and treatment of Henry Lax. That's all they talk about. They don't talk about what the procedure is for. They don't talk about possibility of drafting for cells. Um, and in her medical records, uh, one of her physicians wrote about the fact that she didn't know that she was going to be infertile. She was 29, 30 at the time. Um, she only had four kids, and she said if she knew she was going to be infertile, she would have gone along with that procedure or any form of treatment. I also wanted to note that her children, um, so this is the impact of Henrietta Cell on um, Hilo Cell Studies, the multi million dollar industry. Her children did not know um, in the 1950s when she died um, what her cells were used for, her cells were even used for experiments. In 1970, about 20 years later, they found out. How they found out was Hilo cells were contaminated and they went to go to her children to get blood to see which of uh, the cell lines were actually her cells and all the contaminants. That's how they found out that the cells being used for medical experiments and for um, treatments. Some of the benefits of HeLa cells are it's a scare of the vaccine for polio, it's used for the treatment of Parkinson's, uh, AIDS, influenza, leukemia, and hemophilia. Her children, this is a multi-million dollar industry, like I said, her children are living in poverty. A lot of them are not able to pay the medical bills. A lot of them aren't able to have access to education. Um, and a lot of them are still struggling to this day. Another thing I wanted to talk about is um, the racial difference in the ability to tolerate pain. As you can see, um, I spoke about the antebellum theory and how they did a lot of procedures on black slaves without any pain medication because they thought that black people had a higher pain tolerance. Um, the thought process at the time was black people possessed thicker skulls. They were less, they had less sensitive nervous systems. Um, also in his autobiography, Dr. Sims wrote about um, Lucinda almost dying from sepsis. After she almost died, she recovered four months later and then he continued to do procedures on her. So what does the medical literature say? Um, these are a couple of quotes that I found throughout time um, about, uh, these are textbooks that medical students, residents read. Um, the first one talks about yellow fever and Dr. Rush uh, also wrote that essentially black people were less susceptible to yellow fever than white people, therefore they were able to work in the fields. They should still be able to work and be productive for uh, slave owners. Another quote, the second quote is Dr. Benjamin Mosley is talking about black people's high pain tolerance. And he stated, and I quote, I have amputated the legs of many Negroes who held the upper limbs, the upper part of their limbs themselves. The fourth quote 
is talking about this false belief that black people have a lower lung capacity than whites. Um, when you go to pulmonologist's office today in 2020, if you do a spirometer or any of the machines, they have a race correction for people that are of color. I, unfortunately, when I was in med school, I had to see a pulmonologist, and they actually did a race correction on me myself. This was about three years ago. Another thing I want to talk about is the last quote. Um, it talks about black people often report higher pain intensity than other cultures. This was in a nursing textbook in 2017. That was three years ago. Another thing I want to talk about is I know Sam is known as a father of modern gynecology, but before he worked with women, he also worked with children. And he felt that African Americans were less intelligent because they had thicker skulls that grew really quickly. So he used shoemaker's tools to pry the skulls open of young black children so their brain can have space to grow. So see if they'll be more intelligent than other black kids that we had that experience on them. So does this apply to today? This is something that you've seen, you know, in the 1800s, uh, the late 1950s, but does this apply to 2020? Short answer is yes. Um, this is a particular study that examined whether racial biases is related to false beliefs of biological differences between blacks and whites, particularly with pain assessment. Uh, the first study basically looked at layman's people, people that are not in the medical field, and they said that people that have a higher sense of false belief um, rated people with uh, black people with lower pain thresholds. The second study looked at white medical students and residents. Um, they also saw that participants endorsed higher false beliefs, um, showed racial bias in the accuracy of their treatment recommendations, and also showed that they were more likely to undertreat patients' pain. I worked at CCT shift a couple of months ago, and we had this young kid who was like 20, and he had a G-sided to the right lower extremity. He had to go to the OR the next day. He was there for three hours, and he kept complaining about having pain. The nurses kept telling me, and I, me along with the CCT team kept thinking, okay, just give us some time to kick in. The third hour, the nurse kept saying, Doc, he's really in a lot of pain. Can you please look at him and just address his pain? I tried to review it, and we did not give him any pain medication. We failed this patient. We gave him the ANSEF, we gave him the imaging, he had all the consoles put in, his note was written, and we failed to treat his pain accurately. I failed him because he's, I went to him multiple times before I realized we didn't give him pain medication. I said it was gonna kick in, I never chart reviewed him. And even if he did get pain medication, he's still complaining of pain. I have to still address that. So that's where I failed him. And it made me realize I have to do better. So when I have CCT patients come in, they come with traumas, Part of giving the boost strips and stuff, it's always in my mind, given pain medication. That way I don't forget it. It's something that I think a lot of us are guilty of doing. I don't want any of us to forget that. So it's something that I want you guys to hopefully learn from my mistake. So another thing I want to look at about is how African Americans do the healthcare system. These are three different studies. They basically give surveys to black people across the country. And essentially what they found was black people had a higher mistrust than white people when it came to the healthcare system. The second study looked at elder generations, so people greater than 65 years old. They had a higher mistrust compared to the white um, key participants in the same age group. However, they had a higher trust in the younger participants, likely due to the fact that they have higher comorbid conditions. They see their physicians more often than younger people. But I think we all have had an experience with patients working in the ED that have flat out told us, I don't trust you guys, I wanna go home, and um, you guys are gonna actually listen to me. So another thing I want to talk about is healthcare disparities. Um, the American healthcare system in particular has inequalities that have a disproportionate impact on people of color and have a marginal increase. Some of these gaps are um, gaps in healthcare insurance and even access to healthcare systems for access outcomes, uh, like poor health outcomes in general among uh, certain populations. Unfortunately, African Americans are the front of these healthcare challenges. Um, two things I want to talk about. Um, so some of the things that black people are higher, um, 44 higher chance of having strokes, having from strokes, having heart disease. But two things in particular I want to talk about are homicides and um, obstetric chronic complications. Homicides are the leading cause of death for African Americans. African American children are 10 times more likely to die of gun violence than white children. I think for many of us, especially after COVID comes on, we've seen a surge of um, gun violence in our patient population. I was working overnight in Pete's, and on Friday we had seven level seven GSWs come in. I have seen more thoracotomies than I think my seniors have seen. I have seen done more chest tubes than my seniors have seen. I spoke to a couple of the interns. This is their first block in the ED. A couple of them have already seen thoracotomies, and a couple of them have already done chest tubes. Um, this in particular has affected me because it's heartbreaking to hear um, mothers mourn for their children. 
I can get used to seeing traumas, but I can never get used to caring a parent more for their child. Another thing I want to talk about is um, obstetrical uh, complications. Um, a study, uh, essentially uh, in New York City, according to New York Health Tech Law, Tech Law Black women in New York City are eight times more likely to die from um, obstetric complications than white women. I have a friend, she's a nurse at uh, Downstate. She did IVF when she finally got pregnant and during the pandemic, she had COVID. Her wife uh, is a, she, at the time, she was applying to OBGYN. Um, she was well known at Monty and she had to get him into Montefiore. She had hypoxia and she was tachycardic. She was crying to me and to her wife saying that they're gonna, she's gonna die in the hospital because there's no one to advocate for her. At the time, her wife was not allowed to go in with her. Her wife was a white woman. She said, they're gonna listen to my wife more than they listen, they will listen to me. And I had nothing to say to her to make her feel better. I had nothing to say to her because I too would have felt the same way. Fast forward to six weeks uh, ago, she had a baby girl. Uh, baby was healthy, but she had postpartum hemorrhage. She sent a pie, she had to go to the OR. She had had multiple units of blood transfusion. Mom and baby are fine now, but she's a nurse. She's a black nurse. Um, she's within the system and she has a huge distrust within our system. I can only imagine what lay people feel. I can only imagine what our patients feel as a teacher or a housewife or a lawyer that comes in or even just uh, anyone that can come in worried about their outcome. And our job is to protect them and they feel like we're already failing them already when they come to the door. Another study I want to talk about, um, and it was published, uh, this article came out yesterday, but it essentially said that black babies were three times more likely to die in the hospital than white newborns and cared for white doctors. Um, this is after the CDC produced a study uh, two years ago that found that um, black babies were more than two times as likely to die before the first baby than white babies. This is Shaisha Washington. She was 26 years old when she died of Woodhall in July. The picture on the right is the last picture her family has of her before she died. This is Amber Rose Isaac, and she also died at the age of 26. On April 17, 2020, she tweeted, I can't wait to write a tell all about my experience during the last trimester, my last two trimesters dealing with incompetence and balance at Montefiore. She died four days later. This is Cradell Street. She died in March 2020. She left behind her six year old daughter and she died two days after her second daughter was born. So, another topic I wanted to talk about is is there enough representation in medicine? So the pie on the pie chart on the left is uh, the breakdown of the U.S. medical schools uh, based off the race, race and ethnicity in 2019. The, pie, uh, the other pie chart is based on the breakdown of the U.S. population. What you can see is that there is 18% of uh, Latino and Latina medical students. There's 13% of black students. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, black people in the population. There's only 3% of black and Latino and Latina medical students in American medical schools. According to White Health for Black Lives, to create a representative physician workforce, medical schools will need to admit classes made of entirely Black, Latinx, and Native American students for the next 10 years to reflect the patient population. Another thing I want to talk about is most people that come to medical school come from higher affluent socioeconomic backgrounds. The people that are from lower socioeconomic families are more likely to drop out of medical school in the first two years due to financial hardships. My grandmother, um, she's, she died uh, last year. Um, she had diabetes. She had an uh, amputation uh, in 2015, and she had, she had sepsis when she came to the hospital when she died. They had to amputate her out her leg. Um, and then she died a couple of days later. She, my whole life, she dealt with diabetes, and she had a white physician, and she never really would speak to her doctors about her diet because her doctor would tell her. Um, just start eating rice, stop eating carbs, and then you'll, you know, you'll control your sugar and you'll be fine. She was a baker. She's a Haitian woman. In Haitian diets, Caribbean diets, it's rice, plantain, it's a lot of starch. It's impossible to tell a patient. It's impossible to tell me. I know I'm going to help me to stop eating carbs. I think you have to understand that there is um, a social or cultural barrier that you have to meet your patients halfway. My grandmother didn't want to go to her doctor to talk about her struggles with her diet. So she ended up just giving up. She ate whatever she wanted to eat. She didn't really take her medications. She didn't even understand why she was taking insulin. Um, and from her, I learned that it's my job to educate my patients. Because my grandmother wasn't educated. And it's also my job to work with my patients and meet them halfway. I had a patient 
two months ago on the pod, 32 years old, and he wants a diabetes. I have a silver. I thought he had DKA, but I was wrong. But um, <laughs> anywho, <laughs> um, I told him again, he wants a diabetes, and he didn't understand what that meant. And I told him essentially how diabetes works, why you need insulin. And I worked with him. I said, you know what, I love rice as well. And I asked him his diet was, and he had bagels for breakfast, rice and beans for lunch, rice and beans for dinner. And I said, let's try to work together. Let's try to cut bagels for breakfast first. Let's try to have healthier alternatives. So you can help decrease your sugar intake to help manage your diabetes. Because at the end of the day, I'm taking care of you here, but when you go home, you take care of yourself. And I don't want you to keep coming back. My grandmother died from complications from diabetes. I don't want that to happen to you. I think that yes, we need enough representation. We need to have people of color medicine to help relate to um, our patient population. But I also think it's important for our white colleagues to also improve their understanding of different cultural barriers um, to help improve that relationship with our patients as well. So now that we know this, now that we know that there's hundreds of years of mistreatment in, in, in black, uh, black Americans and that black Americans have mistrust in healthcare systems, we have healthcare disparities, and all these issues. It's important to know that these things aren't going to change overnight. Um, but this program gives me hope. The fact that we have a social Indian lecture series is amazing. Um, I think that this is a conversation that's uncomfortable to have, but we're having it. And the fact that I'm able to have this space and talk to you guys about it is important. So what I want to do is to talk about how we can create a better relationship with our patient. Um, another thing you should know is I love babies. <laughs> I'm in peace. I just try to take them all and give them hugs, and I'm not supposed to when I discharge them, but I just do it out myself. <laughs> um, so this is a question I asked myself for a long time. How can we create a better relationship with our patients? This baby's getting not one but two shots, and he's looking at his mom, and he's super happy, and he's super excited to get shots. Um, I want our patients to come into our ER. I want our patients to be happy. I want our patients to trust us. I want our patients to leave the ER just as happy as this baby. What can we do to improve this? One of the things that I think, um, this is a discussion I wanted to have, but one of the things I um, was thinking about is to know your bias. I think we have to all accept that we all have a bias. Um, I took an implicit bias survey that Harvard had when I started medical school, and I looked at a bias towards um, IV drug users and people that dealt with addiction. Um, rather than saying that it's a flaw, I realized, okay, I have this bias. What can I do better to improve this bias? I made a point to educate myself on the, uh, on the field, and also any patient that I had that came in for overdose or that was using um, drugs, I asked myself, how can I have them trust me, and how can I treat them without having this judgments towards them. And the first, my third and fourth year of medical school, I would ask my patients, what can I do better? Did I attend you with my questions? What questions should I ask better? Um, how can I learn more about your life and your struggles? And it helped me, I think, to this day with relating towards our IBDUs uh, patients. I don't feel like I have this bias towards them. Another thing is to educate yourself in the field. Um, one of the resources that I found helpful was looking at reading medical apartheid on Henrietta Harriet A. Washington. Um, this is a discussion I wanted to have with you guys, but unfortunately I'm running short on time. So if you guys want to um, maybe send emails or we can create a discussion about this, because um, I think it's important for us to talk about this. So to summarize, although SIMS is known as the, um, you know, the high advance advancements in uh, OBGYN, it's at the expense of black space. Um, there are a lot of experiments done on black people which lead to the current mistrust in the healthcare system. There are misconceptions in Black people in medical literature in the past that affects how patients are treated current today in medicine. Um, healthcare uh, disparities still exist to today, and uh, more work needs to be done in order to improve this relationship with our patients. Um, I think, like I, I said, I'll, I'll say again, I think that Kings County is a little gem, I feel like, because we do have a residency that reflects our patient population. And we also have uh, physicians that may not look like their patients, but that may get a point to educate themselves on their patients and cultural backgrounds and differences. But we are a gem. I think that the rest of the country needs to um, change as well. I think things like MRI, AMA, we're trying to work on it, but I think it's important for us to acknowledge that this is an issue and try to see what we can do better for our patients. Any questions or comments? I thought that was amazing. Um, and it really like uh, grounds us and reminds us that these things apply. There's been a couple of times too, where you'll see a patient who's like complaining of pain, who I, I've, I've noticed myself like, oh, okay, they're fine. Or maybe they're overreacting. Mm -hmm. And that's just my own bias too, that I had to check too. So I thought that was great. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's really, 
like I think we've all even we've all had the time where patients don't trust us and like no matter how many times people call me Patch Adam like I swear there's some patients who call me Uncle Tom I've been like I've been like cursed at by a lot of patients who are like I just don't trust you either and sometimes it looks like antagonism sometimes it looks like gleeful misinformation like our patients I think lie to us a lot and tell us a different history because they don't trust us and it seems like you know it doesn't, it's not antagonistic it's just um, like it, there's, a, there's a good book called The Warmth of Other Sons that talks about the Great Migration. It talks about why so many Black people have penicillin allergies that they can't tell you why, what happened to them when they had the penicillin allergy. And the reason for that being is because people in the South thought that, uh, thought that they weren't going to get some of the newer antibiotics. So they thought to tell practitioners that they had penicillin allergies in hopes that they would get another antibiotic. So if you were the person who had triplet, who maybe penicillin was actually the thing that would help you, you still gave your doctor misinformation because you didn't have trust. Sometimes it's antagonism, sometimes it's just misinformation. And another thing I wanted to talk about is after I did this um, research on this lecture, I, I'm sorry, my references. Um, I researched on, on this lecture, um, I had a patient in Keys that um, had really bad asthma, and um, they refused to get home with testing. And I should have told them, because I understand that there's a mistrust in the healthcare system. Um, and it's been over hundreds of years. But um, my job is to, one, um, educate you on, on what's going on and why you want to do this test. And I think the moment I said that, I saw the mother and the patient just kind of relax. Just acknowledging that, I think, makes a huge difference. Because I think a lot of patients think that we make this assumption um, that we know better than them, or, or we are trying to tell them what to do rather than having this discussion. Um, and I think it's important for us to maybe just acknowledge that sometimes if you feel like a patient's being resistant towards uh, medical management, so they can realize that you actually do care about them. You actually do want to work for their best interest. Um, and that's helped me a lot, but um, yeah. Oh, yes, Karen? What was the survey that you were talking about that helped identify uh, five year bias? The five year of IET, you said it was a survey that you took. Oh, well, implicit bias. I will share this with you guys. The Harvard implicit bias. Yeah, I'll share that with you guys in the group chat or I'll email it to you guys. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So, just that I think sometimes you just have to spend a little bit of time listening to the patient. Mm -hmm. um, I've had interactions with, I mean, I think all of us have, where the patient is like yelling, I'm a diabetic and nobody spent me, you know? And you're like, that's not how diabetes works. <laughs> and then when you really sit down and think about it, I know like I have grandparents and parents that really think if I'm a diabetic, it means I need to eat all the time. We need to have like a little piece of candy in my bag, etc. And a lot of times it just takes a few minutes to ask them why they think that. Um, I know I've been working recently with a few people and they're like, no, they just listen to them. I'm like, no, it's not. I listen to them and I just ask them why they think. I mean, we've all heard interactions with our families where, you know, they'll tell you like the egg white is the, most, is the healthier part of the egg, eat this part, eat this part. And those are all things that have, they've been taught by their grandparents and I'm not going to walk in in like five minutes and change everything that they've been told by their culture. Just have to spend a little bit of time to sort of understanding why they think some of these things, and then it's not going to happen in that 15 minutes that you have with that patient. But mm -hmm. just to be patient, I mean, I wouldn't trust you in five minutes. Okay, thanks. Okay.